Uh, okay, folks, we're back with Yuki Maihara, and um, he will speak about uh, our joint project. And I'm just going to say one thing about him, namely, he is combinatorially so strong that Tim and I, during this work, were so intimidated that whenever we would hear the word combinatorics, we wouldn't even say it. We would call it the C word. Uh, <laughs> because of the trauma of how bad we were compared to Yuki. Okay, Yuki. Uh, all right. <laughs> uh, thank you, Chris. And uh, well, thank you for letting me speak at this time. And thank you everyone for coming at this slightly later time uh, and not going to the bar or the club or the pub that maybe you were planning to go to. Uh, yeah, so this is uh, 9 a.m. for me. So I didn't really want to get up at four in the morning to give a talk. So anyway. All uh, right, so yes, this is the joint project with Tim and Chris. And so, yeah, I'll be talking about this cubicle model for weak omega categories. And well, so Brandon told us about uh, the strict uh, cubicle omega categories. So I will, well, but like um, he went, you know, sort of uh, through the theater business, and that was uh, nice and elegant, uh, but I need the direct comparison between the cubicle and globular, well, partly because I'm, you know, that combinatorial. So I'll start by defining the, the cold cubicle object in Omega Cat, uh, which you use to get the direct comparison between the globular and cubicle uh, Omega categories. So uh, we want the cold cubicle object, uh, which I call I, uh, in Omega Cat, and we send, well, the zero cube to you know the terminal omega category is just a single object, uh, the one cube to a single arrow, and now the two cube is well it's supposed to look like a square. So there you go. Uh, we have a square of these one cubes, and in the middle we have well one cells I should say because I'm thinking of these as uh, globular omega categories. And so what I mean by this is we have you know these one cells and obviously they compose and then we want this two cell in the middle. And now uh, in this talk, uh, we go up another dimension and I'll draw the three cubes. So uh, now what is this? Well, I mean, it's, it's a cube. So, you know, we have uh, eight vertices, 12 edges and six faces. Uh, these come from I zeros, I ones and I twos. But in the middle, we have this uh, three cell pointing from here to here, where, uh, so this picture is supposed to be interpreted as, you know, uh, so this two cell can be composed with this one cell, and this two cell with this, and this with this, and then you can vertically compose the whole thing, and you get a single two cell on this side, and same on this side. Uh, all right, so I should probably uh, quickly say that in all my drawings, uh, the directions are ordered according to their gradients. So in dimension two, this is gradient zero and this is gradient negative infinity. So this is the first direction and this is the second direction. So here you can see that this is uh, the one zero phase, uh, you know, so because this is where the first coordinate is zero. Uh, similarly in the three cube, this is the first direction, this is the second direction, and this is the third direction and hopefully I label the faces correctly so that uh, the indices match what I just described. Now, uh, so look at that here, uh, I n is supposed to be, uh, supposed to look like the n cube where in the middle we have an n cell pointing, well, from somewhere to somewhere, but from where to where? Well, uh, the rule is, so if you have a k epsilon space, then that is supposed to be part of the source if k plus epsilon is odd. And if it's uh, even, then it's supposed to be part of the target. And you can find uh, this sort of uh, you know, parity based idea in parity complexes and well, other papers, well, including the Alago Brown Steiner paper. Um, uh, right, yeah. So you can check, so here one plus zero is one, which is odd, so this is part of the source, and similarly two plus one is three, and here three plus zero, two plus one, one plus zero, these are odd and these are even. 
Uh, yeah, so if you draw, sorry, if you order the directions according to uh, the gradients, uh, that is, well, yeah. I'm not sure if, like, well, okay. I don't have an actual proof, but at least up to dimension four, you can actually draw things nicely so that you get all the, the source things on one side and target thing on the other. Uh, anyway, so this is uh, the core cubic object i in omega cat. I mean, I have only defined it up to i equal three, but I mean, sorry, n equal three. Uh, but uh, well, hopefully you get the idea. Now, uh, so from this core cubical object, we can take uh, well, the cubical nerve of any omega category by just mapping out of this i. And well, one thing you can do is, well, so that gives you a cubical set, but then you can equip these uh, cubical nerves with composition operations and well, cubical sort of composition operations so that you get an equivalence between cubical omega categories with connections and global omega categories in the strict case. So this is what Brandon uh, told us about. Uh, but this is not quite what we do in this project. Well, or this is not quite what we use, but rather we encode the omega category structure using open box fillers. Uh, so, uh, I mean, this is supposed to look like, you know, quasi category sort of business. Also, if you know about composition sets, uh, that sort of thing, <coughs> excuse me. And so what's the idea here? Uh, why, like, what, what are these open boxes? Well, if you take the cubical nerve of a, a, a strict omega category, uh, there are some special cubes in there, which are equalities. So if you have any n cell, then, well, you always have the identity n plus one cell on that n cell. And, well, so here's an example. Uh, so if you have a composable pair F and G in your omega category, uh, uh, then well, you can compose them because you're in an omega category, which is this composite GF. And here, this equal sign means this is the degenerate uh, one cube in the nerve or the identity one cell in the omega category. But the equality here, well, I mean, so this, I mean, I'm drawing an equality here because this comes from the the identity two cell in your omega category, but this two cube as a two cube in the cubical nerve doesn't come from uh, the, the degeneracy or connections or any sort of uh, thing. So you can't really tell that this was an identity from just looking at the cubical structure of your nerve. Uh, similarly here, uh, so this is now a three dimensional example. Now, if you have two, uh, two cells, arranged like that in your omega category, uh, then you can compose these into a single two cell. And if you well, stare at these pictures for long enough, then you can see that. So this equality says that this object is the same as that. And this equality says that the composite here is this, and uh, similarly here. So these faces are like this to give. So that's saying that the boundary of this to Q is basically the boundary or the, the perimeter of this whole thing, which is the perimeter of this whole thing on this side as well. And therefore this Q is somehow witnessing that this delta is the pasting of this alpha, beta, gamma. Although you can't tell that this is an identity by just looking at the cubical structure of your nerve. Uh, so there are these special cubes which you can't tell they are special from just uh, the cubical structure. So the idea is to just mark these equality cubes uh, in the nerve. And well, once you do that, then you can encode compositions using uh, by well requiring unique marked fillers for certain open boxes. What do these boxes look like? Well, so now if you look at the picture, I have grayed out the composite bit and also the equality bit. So now this is a, uh, what is it? One zero cube, sorry, a one zero box. Um, uh, so if we require such an open box to have a unique filler, a unique marked filler, then, well, because we are requiring the, the interior to be marked, 
that's saying that whatever this thing is in the filler should be the composite of these two things. So having a unique filler corresponds to having a uniquely defined composite uh, similarly here. <clears throat> so this is now talking about uh, the fact that you can paste two cells in your uh, omega category, but uh, via unique marked fillers for open boxes. Uh, so uh, let's make this a little more precise. So a marked cubicle set uh, is defined to be a cubicle set together with uh, subsets of distinguished marked uh, cubes. So this, uh, well, I mean, we're using this mysterious letter E, but so this EXN uh, is the, the subset of uh, marked N cubes in your cubicle set X. And we only, okay, so the first thing is we want these to contain all the, uh, the cubes coming from the degeneracies and connections. Oh, I should say that the version of the, the cube category we are using is the one with faces, uh, degeneracies, and connections. And uh, so, so these degeneracies and connections, these cubes, well, I mean, if you think about how you take the, the cubicle nerve on all the category, these uh, cubes should correspond to identities, so we require uh, these things to be contained in this subset. And also we only uh, want these subsets for n at least one because it doesn't make sense to talk about identity objects for composition. Uh, now with this category of microcubical sets, which well, I haven't defined what the morphisms are, but you can guess. And now this is the theorem of Steiner, uh, characterizing the nerves of omega categories. So if you take an omega cat, if you take the cubicle nerve of an omega category and then mark exactly the the identity, uh, well, the, mark the cubes coming from identity cells, then you can ca characterize uh, such marked cubicle sets uh, by uh, well as those having uh, unique marked fillers for certain open boxes, which. Uh, at least encode the, the, the composition operations. And additionally, these marked cubes are supposed to compose. Well, compose, I mean, we don't actually have composition operations, but these uh, unique marked fillers uh, encode composition in you know, the sense of the picture that I drew on the previous slide. So you can sort of talk about marked cubes composed to marked cubes, and that's what we require. And yeah, so. Uh, Steiner proves that uh, this way you can characterize cubicle nerves of omega categories. Modulo the fact that this is not quite uh, the version of the cubicle set that he used. He actually used the version where you only have space operations. And in addition to uh, open boxes, he required unique marked fillers for uh, certain uh, boundaries and well, uh, so, so we have that, a question in yep. um, in the chat. Mm -hmm. Is Steiner's proof as hard as Dominic's proof of the street Roberts conjecture? Uh, it's definitely not as long, the paper itself. Uh, however, uh, it uses the equivalence between the, the globular and cubical omega categories. So, I mean, so if you include that as part of the proof, then it gets longer. No, I see more things popping up. I can see the chat. That's sort of the other uh, the other part. Uh huh. Yeah. Fansk. So <laughs> I think that's in Swedish. Uh, uh, yeah. Right. Okay. Uh. <laughs> okay. Uh, right. So uh, so that is how you can characterize nerves of uh, the strict omega categories but we want weak omega categories. So what, it, what do we do? Well, you know, whenever you go from strict to weak, you basically replace every code that you see by some sort of uh, invertible higher morphism. And so in this uh, context, we want the marked cubes to actually correspond to invertible or some sort of weakly invertible morphisms uh, in the omega category. And well, so if we 
now regard the marked cubes as invertible things, then what sort of change do we have to make to uh, these conditions? Well, I mean, we still want these invertible things to compose the invertible things. So this condition stays there. And also uh, at least the existence of uh, marked fillers without uniqueness uh, is saying, well, I mean, it corresponds to the existence of composites. So we do want that because we want something like an order category. Uh, but now these compositions are witnessed by uh, invertible things rather than identities. So it doesn't make sense to ask for unique fillers. So we just drop uniqueness. Uh, so here is the definition of, well, the uh, model of weak omega category. So a comical set, uh, well, I mean, Chris named them. So obviously comical sets. Uh, so, I mean, like the justification is that it comes, comes from composition and cubicle set. But anyway, it's a marked cubicle set in which the boxes that Stan are used, which, well, I haven't defined, but, well, you can describe them. And uh, these things admit marked fillers and these uh, marked cubes compose in the same way they're encoded here. All right, now let's see the chat. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, right. Uh, yes, so there you go, that's our model. Now, um, uh, what's that? right, so I guess I should say at this point that, oops. Uh, there's yeah. another question in the chat. Okay, uh, yeah. Is there an easy way to write down a functor, a delta to stratified cubicle set, uh, oh, mark cubicle set that embeds a sort of the one categories? Uh, wait, wait, I need to see the question. I, I, can, I can elaborate. So uh, like in Dominic's model, you can write down this functor from delta into stratified simpushal sets where you just mark everything above the one cells. Uh, and then that gives mm -hmm, you sort mm -hmm. of a comparison between infinity one categories could, and- Could we defer this question till the discussion? It's kind of a distraction for those oh, of us sorry, who are trying to sorry. follow the talk. Yeah. All right, I guess then I'll answer the question uh, at the end. Uh, all right, uh, so yeah, so I was actually gonna talk about simplicial things because we are heavily inspired by the simplicial case, which is uh, Dom's uh, completion sets. So oh, I guess, right, the strict version uh, of the definition is due to Roberts. Uh, but uh, so a completion set, so this is the simplicial version, uh, is a marked simplicial set in which, well, in the same way, uh, suitable horns admit marked fillers, uh, encoding uh, compositions and, well, other things. And these marked simplices compose. And, well, so in, I mean, so uh, the simplicial version actually predates the cubicle version, but uh, so the strict uh, completion sets uh, equivalent to Omega Cat, uh, which was also proven by Dom. Uh, I mean, so Dom uh, then uh, goes on to study the weak version of these things as a model of uh, weak Omega categories. Um, now, uh, I guess maybe one question I should address here, not Harry's one, but uh, a question is that uh, if there is this simplicial model, then why do we develop another cubicle model? And uh, well, I mean, so different shapes are different for, I mean, different shapes are good for different things. And I mean, we sort of saw that in, I believe Ezra's question from, uh, from the last talk uh, and maybe uh, in Chris's reply to that. Uh, but uh, our focus for this talk is uh, the great answer product which I believe also came up in the previous talk. Um, so, well, I mean, what is this tensor product? So it's a tensor product that you can define on Omega Cat. So there are two versions, Lux and Pseudo, or at least there should be two versions. I don't think the Pseudo version has been defined on the strict thing anyway, but, uh, right, so the Lux, great tensor product. Uh, so this, is a kind of tensor product that shifts dimension in the sense that 
for example, if you uh, send a one cell with a one cell, well, if this were the Cartesian product, then we just get a commutative square of these one cells. But in the Lux gray tensor product, instead you get a two cell in the middle. So the square doesn't commute, but just has a two cell in the middle. And well, this, you know, looks like the geometric product of cubical sets. And well, if you remember the core cubical object from the, the first slide, then, oh, okay, so I guess another thing I should say is that, uh, well, as you know, is the case for anything to do with category sort of structures, these things are supposed to be suitably compatible with identities and compositions. And well, I don't make this precise, but I sort of use this idea later. Uh, but anyway, uh, I was saying that, uh, so this tensor product, I believe, was first defining the thesis of Kranz. And there he also uh, basically shows that this gray tensor product is part of a unique by closed model structure on omega cat, such that uh, if you tensor i m and i n, then you get i of m plus n, uh, where these i things are the the omega categories that I introduced at the beginning. Uh, right, and the pseudo version, I mentioned there were two versions. Uh, in the pseudo version, well, we don't get a, well, we don't get a genuine higher cell, but instead we sort of ask for uh, things to commute not after equality, but after higher invertible things. Uh, right, so, I mean, as you can see from this theorem, uh, these tensor products are somehow inherently cubical. And uh, well, I mean, uh, so in the, the strict uh, case, you can actually see that uh, Kranz, so before uh, giving his uh, uh, like regress combinatorial definition, he actually mentioned that you can construct this gray tensor product on omega cat by observing that omega cat is monadic over cubical sets and then use the, the geometric, geometric product on cubical sets to define this gray tensor product. And as I believe Brandon or maybe Harry mentioned in the previous talk, uh, if you read uh, Alago Brown Steiner equivalence paper, then they, well, basically uh, define the, the gray tensor product on the the cubical side, because it is basically just a geometric product, and you have to do more work to make sure that what you get are omega categories. But uh, the geometric intuition is that it's basically just the, the the geometric product, and then transfers that product to the globular omega categories uh, because they're equivalent. Uh, right. So, uh, so why did I start talking about these tensor products? Well, the point was. Uh, that we are uh, developing this cubical model for weak omega categories so that hopefully these gray tensor products are easier to deal with. So let's actually define these gray tensor products on marked cubical sets. So, uh, I mean, the whole point of using cubical sets is so that we have access to the geometric product. So, I mean, basically that is what has to do at least on the underlying cubical set level. So for example, if you uh, tensor a one cube with one cube, then we should get a two cube. But what about marking? Because this is an extra structure that, uh, that we have to uh, take into account. So let's consider now, instead of just a one cube with a one cube, a marked one cube, so this orange indicates being marked, uh, uh, so now we are tensoring a marked one cube with an unmarked one cube. Uh, let's see what should be on this side. Well, uh, the first thing is, well, we want the zero cube to be the unit for this tensor product. And we want this tensor product to be functorial, right? Uh, so in particular, uh, into this one cube, you can map the zero cube in two different ways. So into the domain or the core domain. And that should uh, induce maps from this tensor zero cube, which is just this itself, into whatever is on this side. 
uh, including this arrow into uh, the top and bottom horizontal arrows. And because we assign that this is marked, that means in the tensor product, these should be marked as well. Uh, so that takes care of uh, these horizontal uh, one cubes. Now about these vertical ones, well, uh, the same sort of idea. Now, if we consider the degeneracy from this marked one cube to the zero cube, well, that should induce uh, a map from whatever is on this side to this factor. Uh, in particular, that projects uh, this one cube and this one cube to this one cube. Uh, because we are saying that this is unmarked, that means these vertical one cubes should also be unmarked because well, maps of marked cubic sets need to preserve markings. So that tells us what, like how to mark the boundary bit of this two cube, but what do we do to the two cube itself? Do we mark it or not? Well, so all of uh, the discussion so far just depended on like how uh, uh, we want the tensor product to be functorial and how we want the, the zero cube to be uh, the unit. But now we actually have to think about what the marking means because that argument doesn't really tell us how to like deal with the two cube in the middle. Well, the idea is we said marking or marked cubes should correspond to invertible things. So let's imagine having an inverse on this side. I mean, this doesn't actually exist in the marked one cube, but let's just imagine it does. Well, then on the tensor product side, they should also exist, right? Uh, now, so that means we should morally have something like this. So now we have, instead of this orange black square, just uh, a cube or, or the square of black square, so black, black, black arrows. And uh, so, I mean, these uh, two cells there are always supposed to point up. And yeah, so, so this is the correct direction of the two cells. And I'm gonna draw it like this. So this arrow is pointing from here to here. So you can draw it like this. Now, uh, I mean, now we have this to Q, but also we have these orange arrows. So we should be able to whisker this cube with, or compose this cube with uh, these orange arrows. And that gives us something like that. Now, uh, but like when we introduced these black horizontal arrows, they were supposed to be inverses to the orange arrows. So that means uh, the domain and codomain of this two cell are basically just that. And well, now we, need to uh, use the compatibility of um, these uh, higher cells introduced in the great tensor product with the unit and composition in your omega category. But uh, by using these conditions uh, suitably, you can actually show, at least in the strict case, uh, the, the two cell you get this way, which points from this to this. So from this to this. So it points in the opposite direction to the original two cubes or the two cell. Uh, you can deduce that it should actually be an inverse to your original two cell. Now, uh, what, did we say, what did we say about the marking? Well, we said like marking uh, indicates uh, invertible things. And we just said this middle thing is invertible, so it should be marked. There you go. So that is how we define the great tensor product, at least on this particular pair of a marked one cube with an unmarked one cube. Uh, now you can see in this picture that, uh, so uh, in this uh, tensor product, uh, the marked cubes in here are precisely those that get mapped to the marked one cube in this horizontal factor. So, you know, if it basically moves horizontally, then it's marked and otherwise it's not marked. And that will be our general definition. So that was a long and picture full of justification for this uh, definition. So uh, in the great tensor product, well, on the underlying cubicle sets, we just take the geometric product, but the marked thing 
in this new tensor product is something that was marked in either of the factors. Uh, yeah, so you can uh, describe uh, cubes in uh, the, the geometric product as uh, geometric products of cubes from the, the original factors. So we define such a cube to be marked dependent on if either x or y was marked. Uh, no, uh, okay, I still have some time, but um, now that was a justification for the definition of the lax version and the pseudo version. I don't draw any more pictures because I don't have time and also I didn't have time to prepare these pictures. Uh, but I mean, the idea is, well, in, well, so the pseudo gray tensor product is supposed to be some sort of um, up to homotopy version of the, the Cartesian product. So basically like all the, the new higher cells that you get should be invertible. They're just replacement for identities. And so basically, uh, uh, well, I mean, so if you combine that idea with uh, the geometric intuition of the geometric product, uh, then you can sort of see that like this is probably the right definition, namely. So in the pseudo gray tensor product, it's easier to describe which cubes are unmarked. And these are precisely uh, cubes of the form unmarked tensor, an object or an object tensor unmarked. Now, uh, so that is our definition or our definitions of the gray tensor products. Uh, let me take a two second break. Now, uh, uh, do we have a question? Um, so the question is, does the pseudo gray uh, product agree with the Cartesian product? Uh, no, no. Uh, I mean, maybe Chris is better than me at like, describing this sort of thing, but like, uh, uh, the Cartesian product is not the right thing here. Just, yeah, uh, because we don't have uh, enough maps in the in the, the the cube category. Yeah, remind us what cubes these are. Sorry. Uh, remind us what cubes these are. Oh right. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. So we are. Uh, 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 using the version where we have faces, uh, degeneracies, and uh, uh, connections. Both connections, uh, maybe. Ah, yes. Uh, uh, yes, both connections. As, yes, I insisted. <laughs> <laughs> so that gives us an extra duality. Um, anyway, yeah. Uh, any more questions? Uh, yeah, should we expect nonetheless that the pseudo gray tensor product and the Cartesian product agree up to weak equivalence? Huh. Uh, probably not, but I'm not sure. Wait. Because I'm just thinking that in, you know, at least when wait, you wait, use wait. cubicle sets uh, with connections to model uh -huh. infinity groupoids, the uh -huh. you know, Cartesian product oh, is homotopically well behaved. Right, I see. Uh, so certainly they're not isomorphic okay. as cubicle mm -hmm. sets, but perhaps you could expect them to be, yeah, we have uh, What do I want? Uh, okay, maybe, maybe. I don't know, I haven't really thought about so, it. So actually, uh, this raises an interesting question. Uh, so you are laying out some uh, filling conditions. Are they mm -hmm. actually compatible with the gray tensor product? Is that what you're about to tell us? That or? will be on the next slide. Oh, very good. Okay. <laughs> because as Alex just remarked, it's compatible with the Cartesian product. But um, yeah. Uh -huh. So. All right. So I guess that was a nice segue to the next slide. So. Uh, I mean, I define what a comical set is, but okay. now, uh, of course, uh, as usual, there is a model structure on the category of multi cubical sets uh, where the core vibrations are the models and the vibrant objects are these comical sets. And well, you can actually uh, characterize vibrations into vibrant objects as, uh, you know, by the right lifting property with respect to these 
open box inclusions. But I guess this was uh, uh, it's lost points. Ah, which hmm. is the this model structure is uh, monoidal with respect to both of the gradients of products. So uh, that uh, justifies the definitions to some extent. At least this is some sort of meaningful tensor product uh, on the, the, the comical set world. Uh, now, uh, how do you prove this? Well, so, I mean, so, it, yep. Sorry, can I just, so that mm -hmm. in other words, that the, mm -hmm. the tensor product of a trivial cofibration with a cofibration or vice mm -hmm. versa mm -hmm. is, is a trivial cofibration. Is a trivial cofibration. That's what yep. that statement is. Good, mm -hmm. okay. And that's something you just check in 20 pages or uh, ah, is there a I more see. systematic approach? <laughs> right. Uh, so that is, yes, part of this bit, right? Uh, so I mean, the oh, point oh, of... good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the point of using cubicle sets is so that these great tensor products are hopefully easier to deal with. And that is indeed the case. Uh, I mean, it's not 20 pages. It's... Uh, maybe two pages or something. Um, well, uh, okay, I'll leave this to the end. But, but, uh, I have a quick comment, namely the yeah. relatively easy combinatorics is a relative notion. Um, and uh, the other thing is, um, uh, Harry has a question in chat. Uh, so one thing that's missing from the literature on completional set is compatibility of the tensor product with the saturation conditions from Emily's note. Do you prove uh, this for comical sets? Ah, uh, right. Uh, I think that will be on the next version of this slide. The saturated and all interview versions of, well, this theorem. So I guess that answers the question. Yep. Yeah. And there seems to be agreement that that was a good question. Yes. Okay. Let's. Right. Good. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, right. So that. Uh, oh. If you hear the noise, it's because it's quite rainy here. I'm not sure if you can hear it, but. Uh, right. So. Uh, I guess that was also a, a nice segue to the next segment of the talk uh, because the completion thing was uh, mentioned again. And so the, the last bit of this talk is about how uh, this cubicle model relates to the completion model uh, via the triangulation, which we have seen in this seminar. Uh, do we have any more questions or is this just? Comments? I think there is uh, some ongoing discussion, but maybe uh, the results could be communicated if necessary at the end of the time. Uh, okay, cool. Uh, if there's anything, uh, I'll, I'll try to bring it up. All right. Yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, 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 the triangulation. Uh, so, I mean, as the name suggests, it's a funk there uh, that triangulates cubicle things into uh, simplicial things. And well, so, uh, I mean, we have seen the unmarked version of this, but now we want a marked version of the translation functor. So what do we do? Well, uh, so in, the, in our cubicle model, uh, the n cube is just the, well, by definition, the n fold uh, gray tensor product of uh, copies of the one cube. So we just send it to the n fold gray tensor product of delta one in the simplest world where this uh, tensor product is uh, DOM's uh, lux gray tensor product, uh, which I won't define. Uh, now, uh, so that's where we send the, the unmarked n cubes, but what do we do to the marked n cubes? Well. One thing you can uh, prove is uh, about so these uh, gray tensor powers of delta one. Uh, so, I mean, so this is what the uh, the case n equal two looks like. 
So the underlying uh, simplicial set of this is just the Cartesian version of this power. Uh, so in particular, if you uh, take uh, delta one squared, then we have these uh, two non-degenerate two simplices, and they point away from each other. But by marking one of them, you can sort of see, well, so, uh, so this marking uh, should indicate that the diagonal thing here is basically the composite on this side. So, uh, so in that sense, this arrow is basically pointing from this composite to this composite, which looks like the picture we have on the left. And uh, in the same way, uh, in the, the gray tensor power of delta one for any n, we have a unique unmarked n simplex, which I'm calling iota n, uh, which basically corresponds to the unique n cell in the middle of the n cube uh, in the cubical world or in the i n. Uh, from the, the core cubical omega category. So uh, where do we send the marked any cube? Well, we just mark that last unmarked thing as well. Uh, so in the case n equal to two, that looks like this. Uh, now, uh, so do we know that we are doing the right thing? Well, yes. So what you can prove, this time not quite two pages, but with some work, you can prove that this ramification functor is left cooling with respect to uh, the comical model structure and the completion model structure, and more of a strong monoidal with respect to both gray tensor products, except that you can see that there is this space here. Uh, well, what's the catch? Well, this is supposed to be valued in precomp which is a reflective subcategory of the category of max simplicial sets. And well, I mean, probably even if we map into the, the genuine Mach uh, simplicial sets, this theorem would be true up to homotopy. But in precomp, uh, uh, well, max simplices and great tensor products are more well behaved. So in uh, so by mapping into precomp, uh, well we get this theorem up to isomorphism. Uh, well, I guess I should say that precomp is still, well, well, it still supports a model structure equivalent, equivalent to the original completion model structure on the market cubicle sets. So, uh, so, so yeah, that shows that, well, well, the great answer products that we have on the cubicle on the simplicial world uh, agree in some sense. And, well, I guess that's the end. Let me Thank just you. try to remember. So pre-comp is this is, mm -hmm. or a marked simplicial set is pre-complicial if it has the thinness extensions. Yes. Uh, so you're saying firstly that there's a, so that you said there's a reflective, mm -hmm. I guess, full subcategory just spanned mm -hmm. by those things that have the thinness yep. extensions. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And on there, maybe the two versions of the lax gray tensor product coincide or something. Yes. Is that yeah. what's going on? Yeah. So you get a genuine uh, bi-close monoidal structure. Great. Thanks. So I'm not following the Wait, issue sorry. Can I, can I just, yeah. sorry, can I interrupt? Yeah. Because uh, Yuki technically finished his talk. So I could just <laughs> yeah, that's right. Thank him. <laughs> thank him first, and then we'll move to questions. So uh, yeah, please join yes. me. Uh, applauding and uh, and now uh, I I believe there is a question. I also <laughs> have a question. Yeah, but well, I have. So I, yeah, let's I, start with I mean, so I, I mean, this distinction here is a bit perplexing because I think so the the value it takes values in precomp, but precomp is a subcategory of mm -hmm. marked sim simplicial sets. So yep. it certainly takes values in Mark's simplicial sets. I mm -hmm. think what you're saying is that it's only left quillum into a closed model structure that you have constructed on pre-completial sets. Is that what the statement is meant to say? Uh, because otherwise I don't understand, I don't understand the distinction that you're trying to make. Since, right. Uh, uh, your parenthesis okay. is a, uh -huh. a stronger statement, <laughs> not a weaker statement. I see. Uh, so <laughs> I mean, so it's a reflective subcategory. So the inclusion of precomp into marked cubical sets uh, is, well, it's not co-continuous. So, I mean, you know, it, it, it's a leftward chain, not a, 
sorry, it's a right adjoint, not a left adjoint. So if you compose them, then you don't yeah. even get an adjunction. Right. Um, uh, now, probably there is a way to actually map into uh, the map simplicial sets. And then if you reflect to precomp, you uh, uh, recover the version I'm talking about yes. here. Yeah. Uh, now that version, I haven't like checked all the details because everything up to home the and I couldn't really be bothered to check all that. Uh, but um, I think that would be still left quillum. Uh, oh. I mean, if you define the right way, uh, but that would, uh, would it be harder to check? Probably not. Probably you can reuse uh, the theorem here and, uh, because the reflection, uh, I mean, the unit of the reflection uh, is, a, is a weak equivalence. Uh, but then the strong monoidalness uh, sort of doesn't make sense on the lax gray tensor product. Uh, well, I mean, okay, I mean, it makes sense as like it's a well defined notion, but that will only be true up to homotopy. Ah, yeah. I'm not sure. I, is, is there a paper? I didn't quite understand. Uh, so uh, the, the paper is on Chris's <laughs> website. Uh, it was like we were hoping that it would be on archive uh, as I start uh, this talk, but that is probably oh, I not see. the case. So yeah. this <laughs> question is actually <laughs> relevant. <laughs> uh, so yeah, the archive doesn't announce on Friday evenings in the US uh, because we're supposed to be in bars, right? So. Uh, yeah, so it will be on the archive on Sunday evening. So yeah, I, just want, I just want to mention that we actually stopped going to bars because some of our grad students were under 21. And uh, so we now have our happy hour in the department to avoid that issue. <laughs> <laughs> but don't tell anyone. <laughs> I just told everyone. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. No, you can trust us. <laughs> so here's what I'd like to be true. Um, so there's a uh, there's a marked version of the homotopy coherent nerve mm -hmm. um, that goes from uh, marked simplicial sets uh, and categories enriched over marked simplicial sets. Though I think I guess my favorite way to define that is when you're enriching over marked simplicial sets, you are, are allowed to mark zero simplices as well. Mm -hmm. um, just so you can keep track of the equivalences. And mm -hmm. I'd like to factor that, have an, an analog of the kapulkin voivodsky result. So I'd like to, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's sort of transparently obvious um, because you define the HOMs and this marked homotopy and the marked homotopy coherent simplices as lax gray tensor products. Uh, you, you know, it, sorry, lax gray tensor powers of the interval. So I, uh, I feel like it should just um, immediately factor through uh, um, through these um, cute comical comically enriched <laughs> categories right? to, through comically enriched categories, and I'd like to take advantage of that to prove that this thing is left quillen um, or quillen equivalent. So maybe we're going to need saturation in there to make that quite correct. Uh, the question is, will you will you prove that? <laughs> so. Uh, so Chris and I were talking about this. Um, basically, like we didn't have enough time to like think about it properly before this talk. <laughs> but uh, that will like it is on our list. Great. Uh, I remember there being something a little subtle. Uh, I'd have, it's been a while since I've thought about this seriously, but um, there's something a little subtle going on because. Uh, it, like there's a question of whether you're, when you're talking about things enriched over uh, marked simplicial sets, there's a question of whether you're enriching over the lax gray tensor product or over the gray tensor product. And mm -hmm. I think you define uh, the HOM cubes um, sort of initially as lax gray tensor powers, but then you mark some additional things, which is like what would happen if you changed base to make it a enrichment over the gray tensor product. Um, it's so it's the issue has to do with uh, you know in some of the faces of uh, the hom for a three cube or something you've got stuff that's composites of uh, marked simplices that isn't marked there's no marking in the lax grade tensor 
power, um, but because it's a composite of two equivalences, it ought like a horizontal composite of two equivalences, it ought to be an equivalence. That's that's kind of the issue. Um, so there's something a little bit subtle in the definition that. Uh, yeah, that was in Dom's second paper, right? Yes. This like uh, complicated thing. Yeah, uh, it, it was a little hard to understand what was going on there. I didn't That's read it right. in too much detail. That's right. Yeah, well, I think it's quite subtle. <laughs> so, um, but yes, yeah. That's right. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, Yuki, so I sent you uh, mm -hmm. an email a while ago, and well, not a while ago, like last week, uh, and there was that construction. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't need to go into too much detail, but I was wondering, do you think that it factors through this sort of comical thing? It sort of looks cubical in its construction. Oh, uh, right. I see. I see. Uh... Uh, wait, sorry. Uh, uh, what construction? Um... <laughs> Uh, it's a uh, it's a functor from multi we, multi simplicial sets into uh, stratified simplicial sets. All right, that sort of looked like uh, what Brandon was talking about, right? Yeah, it sort of looked it sort of looked like it, yeah, I don't know. It sort of looked uh, multi cubical. I don't know. I don't know. Right. Um, may I may I suggest that yeah, maybe while we're recording, let's try to stick to questions that. All of us can understand that don't rely. Oh, sorry, on sorry. Talking about, about that. communication that took place, uh, yeah, which, uh, yeah, sorry about that. A while ago. <laughs> um, okay, uh, I, I'm gonna ask uh, uh, Martina. Should I read uh, your question? Uh, I, th I think Emily already asked, and you said that it's on your list, right? Ah, uh, yeah. Okay, okay so this is right. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to know if the theorem was with or without saturation, and do you have any idea if it's going to be equivalent equivalence, if it should be? Right. Uh, so, oh, so about this theorem, uh, so, uh, I mean, it's sort of said it in the other way, but like we first uh, proved that it's strong monoidal and then use that to prove it's left equivalent. So we do need the fact that the model structure on the simplicial side is monoidal with respect to the lax gray tensor product. And so that is not proven for the saturated case, I believe, at least I couldn't find it. Uh, I, think we, I think we checked it. Uh, yeah, we can, we can talk about it, but I, okay. I, I think for completion set, we have it and yeah. Okay, cool. Okay, in that case, maybe uh, we can just uh, use that to I'll extend this to the saturated version. Uh, okay. About quillin equivalence bit, uh, well, we might need the marked version of the cubification or what, straightening or straightening over the point, as Chris calls it. Uh, but um, yeah. Yeah, thanks. That's really, really cool. I really like it. But following up on that, you expect. Can you I just make a comment about uh, the, the other thing uh, that, yeah, the, there's always some magic in proving that P is uh, an equivalent. Like in infinity zero case, you need something like test category theory. And in um, infinity one, we had to rely on straightening. Uh, so yeah, uh, it seems like this result will take a bit. Uh, but sorry, I didn't, uh, yeah, Brandon, go ahead. Uh, well, that, that, that's related. I was just asking, so do you expect um, it to be equivalent? Not equivalent? Sorry. Sorry. Not oh, sweetie. Is she okay? I don't see why sh it shouldn't be. Sorry, sweet. I'm on a, I'm on a call right now. Uh, I think we have some people. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Yuki? Uh, wait, what? Equivalence. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, what did I say? Uh, yeah, like I don't see any reason why it shouldn't be an equivalence, but actually, the whole point is that you want it to be an equivalence, right? Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah. Sorry, is yeah. this the triangulation function you're talking about, or something? Else? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, do you have any uh, prospects on trying to show that this model is equivalent to any of the sort of non-marking based models? Uh, 
Well, hmm. Like so, the, the triangulation func that um, basically, well, not triangulation, like it won't be triangulation, but like, uh, so what left quillian functors out of uh, the macrocubical sets can be defined as soon as you have some reasonable notion of lax gray tensor product in whatever <laughs> model you're trying to compare. So, yeah, so that's probably the opposite of what you want, right? <laughs> That's exactly the opposite, yeah. <laughs> because I want a, I want the great tensor product. I don't care about the model. Yeah, 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 I know. All right, thanks. Yeah. Right, and then, uh, maybe. Uh, I mean, I have a million questions, but some of them are private, you know, so. I'll, I'll email. Maybe that's a legitimate strategy. Yes. Uh, okay. Well, anyway, it was a great uh, talk. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, uh, okay. Well, uh, if there are no further questions, I suggest we thank Yuki again. Um,